I'm Rob Moore. And I'm Lee Moore. This is the Chinese Literature Podcast. What are we looking at today, Rob? Well, we've got two of this kind of literature up there. This is what they call a huaban, which is a vernacular story written in the Ming Qing era. Hang on, wait a second. I thought they didn't write vernacular fiction this in is... the Ming Qing, <laughs> according to that Everyone. May Fourth podcast this we is... did. No, this is funny. This is this is a long-standing maybe grudge in the Chinese literary field because modern Chinese literary scholars in the mainland, anyway, Chinese mainland, will say things like. Oh, yeah, vernacular literature. That that happens in 1919. Yeah, Lu Xun sort of created it. Invented you know. it, yeah. Actually, no. Vernacular literature has been around a long time. Not true. Okay, yes. great. So we've reviewed a couple of other stories. One of them is a male mentions his mother, saves her son three times. And our first podcast was The on... Pearl Sewn Shirt, wasn't no, it? No, 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 it, it wasn't it, the Pearl Sewn Shirt. It was the, the telescope The one. telescope of Gods and Telescope. You can that was to the law. That's an old one, yeah. I know. So we've got those two up there. This is another story. It's from the collection Stories Old and New. The name of the story is Shen Xiu Causes Seven Deaths with One Bird. Mm. Sounds fun. It is fun. It's an optimistic story. It's very happy. It's very upbeat. <laughs> Everybody dies at the end. Everyone dies. Parents are bereaved. People are beheaded and tortured and flayed and animals. They actually think the only thing that survives in the story is the bird. The bird does survive. <laughs> I think everyone else just dies. Yeah. So do you want to try to summarize the plot? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a pretty simple plot. The summary is going to be a little kind of long, but... What happens is Shen Shou is this guy who loves walking around with his bird. He loves going out and strutting it with... He's with, a young man. He's a young man. And like all young men, he loves his, his little bird. He likes, he likes playing with his bird. Exactly. One day, he is a little sick, and so he passes out while walking around with his bird. Uh, Cooper, a guy who makes barrels, named Mr. John. Is just happens to walk by him and sees the bird, decides to steal it, but just as he's stealing it, Shen Shou wakes up and goes, Hey, what's up? I mean, obviously it's in kind of vernacular. This is Chinese. exactly what it says. He says, Hey, what's up? And so Mr. Zhang feels obliged to go and murder Shen Shou. As you would. As as we all would do. And okay. absolutely. So Mr. Zhang cuts off Shen Shou's head. And hides it in a willow tree. You know, they find the body. They're trying to figure out kind of what's going on. All the while, Mr. Zhang recognizes that this is hot property. He sells it to a guy who... The just, bird, not the, the head. bird. The bird, who just happens to be kind of in town. His name is Li Ji. We'll come back to Li Ji. The courts are trying to figure out what's going on, whose body this is, and... Shen Shou's parents come, and they're like, hey, we demand justice. So they put out kind of a wanted poster. Both for the murderer and to find the head. Just so happens, a father and two sons, they're nobodies, doesn't matter who their name is. And the father is very sick, and they are all very poor. And the father says to the two sons, hey, I'm going to die soon. Why don't you just kill me? And so they do that. But why do they kill him? They kill him so that they can cut off his head, bury it near a lake so that it becomes so encrusted with junk. You can't really tell who it is. And then they just say they happen to find this head fishing one day, and they turn it in and get the reward for the head. Of Shen Xiu. Oh, sometime later. Shen Xiu's father goes to the capital, and he sees the bird in the imperial aviary. He's like, hey, what's happening? The imperial aviary guy goes and looks and sees that this guy named Li Ji donated the bird to the emperor. They go and find this guy, Li Ji, and they're like, hey, where did you get this bird? It happened to come from a guy whose head got cut off. Did you have anything to do with that? He says, no, I bought it from this guy. I can't remember really that much about this guy, but it, I didn't you know, steal the bird. I certainly didn't murder this guy. And they go, oh, really? And then they torture him until he admits to doing it. And this is the kind of thing they wouldn't be doing on CSI. Yeah. Um, CSI. Ancient not Chinese style. style. Torture. It's a little more graphic. They, they eventually execute Li Ji. But the guys who Li Ji was with when he bought the bird hear about this execution. And they're like, uh, no, he actually did buy the bird from some guy. And they give the name and the occupation of that guy. The courts go and track down that guy who is Mr. Zhang. You'll remember who is the Cooper. 
they torture him, they get a confession out of him, then they execute him. They then also go and ask the two nobodies who killed their father and turned in his head what happened. They torture them and, uh, you know, eventually execute them. And then at the very end, the wife of Mr. Jung, who was pretty cool with spending the money that he got from this bird, she sees her husband executed, and then she's walking away, and she falls and hurts her internal organs and dies. So that's that's a, a long review of a short story where you kind of have all these moving parts that have to be covered. And... <clears throat> And we should point out, um, you know, usually when you summarize a story, you can give a much shorter thumbnail sketch. But it's usually because there are only a few characters, and most of the story is is just simply their thoughts, their feelings, what are they doing. In this vernacular fiction, it's sort of like today's action movies. Um, what the action hero is actually thinking is really not that important. Uh the entire Transformers series, for example. <laughs> Massive worldwide hits. Does anyone really care what Shia LaBeouf's character you is know, actually feeling and thinking? It doesn't matter, I right? mean, what's definitely going on in this story is that we're kind of... It, it's not so much the the plot, which the plot is a series of, of essentially causes and effects. It's like it, a really messed up farce. It's it's a it's it's a Lou Gold, Goldberg machine, right? Yeah, it really is a Rube Goldberg it's, it's, machine it's of narrative. The literary, the literary equivalent of a Rube Goldberg machine. Rube, that's all to try and come to this conclusion that that comes at the end of the story. It's a short poem and I'm going to read it out. Okay. Good deeds beget good fortune. Evil acts bring evil upon oneself. Think this over carefully and you'll find Heaven and earth never make a mistake. Mm. And this brings in one of the key components of vernacular fiction from this period, which is karmic retribution. Right. All Huabans have a moral, and all Huabans are focused on that kind of idea of karma. That's what goes around comes around. Exactly. My name is Earl of sort of, of you know vernacular <laughs> fiction, and, um, but it, it is true. It's interesting because when you read uh, genre fiction like science fiction or detective fiction, the, the the constraints of the genre and the way the authors play with those constraints mm -hmm. are what make the novel. So if you're reading a detective story, there are just certain components that are always going to be there, right? You expect them. Now, sometimes you may be fooled, like, oh, wait, the detective actually doesn't know something. But in the end, if, if it doesn't work out at all, then it's arguable whether it actually belongs in the genre, right? And so in this case as well, you start the story, an innocent, albeit kind of useless, vapid little kid with a bird, is killed, and you know from that point on, okay, the real story now is how's this guy going to get his? Because we know he is. This is the universe of the vernacular short story. How is Mr. Jung going to be like see justice? Or is he going to see justice? Like That's kind of the tension. I mean, in almost all Huavans, he would see justice. Mm -hmm. But like how it kind of comes about. And so that sort of long delayed action is really the heart of yes. the tension of the story. It's one of the reasons the story is well known and, and, and well worth reading. But I, I guess I, to go back to that, that poem that I ended with, good deeds beget good fortune, evil acts bring evil upon oneself. Think this over carefully and you'll find heaven and earth never make a mistake. Is that true? In what way? What do you mean? Well, I mean, like, Li Ji, he just buys the bird. He doesn't do anything evil. Didn't heaven and earth make a mistake there? I don't know. Uh, it, yeah, I suppose... But if, that's, if, that's important for the story. Right. Like, if we, are, if we are saying that this is all about karma well, it, and what you know, goes around what, comes around. Well, see, one way you could read what Li Ji's doing is, why is he buying this bird from this shady dude who shows up and is just trying to sell him something? Why does he not notice that this guy is in a hurry... To offload this property. And then he probably, this guy who makes barrels for a living, probably. How does he have an expensive, beautiful bird that he's selling? This is. For a low price, yeah. Right. Now, whether or not his, his being tortured and executed actually matches what he did is kind of debatable. 
Right. I guess that's my question. I mean, he definitely does do something wrong in not recognizing that there's a problem here. When he's well, but you know, we're also dealing with, uh, whenever we're talking about vernacular fiction, you're dealing with a really sort of fleshly sort of pulp fiction kind of thing. And one of the things that gets the readers going, as with any action movie, is to sort of turn the volume up on one component of the story. So, right, when, when you ha- you've had action movies for as long as there have been movies. But once the violence really gets nasty, first of all, why does it need to get nasty? There's really no reason. It, it advances the plot just fine if someone gets shot but you don't even see it. Mm. But showing the bullet enter the chest and blood explode out and, uh, you know, whatever, make it quote-unquote realistic. Like John Woo film. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, there's something, it's satisfying some sort of, frankly, pornographic desire for violence. Yeah. Uh, and that's just kind of a part of the genre. And here, I think just that karma has its way mm-hmm. is not enough, right? If you really want to bring the readers in, you give them something a little more. Like, yeah, this guy got his... Through torture and death. Like, now we've got readers coming in. But, I mean, I don't think that's really necessary. We've already had, like, a head cut off at this point, and uh, two heads cut off, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, I'm going to be devil's advocate here, because you and I have had a discussion about yeah. Kill Bill. This is, for me, the Kill Bill of vernacular short stories. Can we have the story of Kill Bill without the unbelievably over-the-top sort of... Aesthetic, aestheticized Because I mentioned, I can't stand that movie because all it is is violence. And your position is, well, it's, it's artfully violence. crafted yeah. violence. So I guess I guess my counter to that would be to bring it back to Shensho, the story. Right. I don't think this story is all that artfully crafted mm. in the violence. And the whole story, the whole, like, morality of it hangs on this very thing. Heaven and earth never make a mistake. If that doesn't work, then either we have to interpret this story as ironic, or we have to say the story is a piece of poop. <laughs> well, a lot of these are. I mean, let's be honest. No, it's but not I like, mean, like you know, reviewing. So we're talking about a story. We should give some context. We're talking about a story written by Thung Mung Lung. Mm-hmm. He is the guy as far as it comes with Hua Ben. There are other guys. Um, so Li uh, Li Yu, who wrote the telescope story. He, Liu, does more kind of irony stuff, but Feng Meng Long is the guy for the classic mm. setup of the Hua Bin John. Right. I just don't know if we really, like, if justice is served, if, if mistakes are made. Mistakes clearly are made by Why? some people. I mean, Li Ji did not deserve to get tortured. Did he deserve to get killed? No. Why? Because all he did was he he made this mistake in evaluating the situation. But I don't... I mean, certainly the courts, from their own analysis, are like, whoops, we screwed up there. Our bad. That was right. another one who got tortured who probably shouldn't have. Right? See, I don't know. I guess when, when, I'm, when I'm discussing the architecture of a story like this, I, I, I might draw the ire of people who study this for a living, but I'm not looking at it at, in the same way I would look at, say, Hong Lomong, like the Dream of Red Mansions, which is a work of literature, capital L. Mm-hmm. This is more interesting for its play in the genre than it is as a work of great capital L literature. But I don't think this is playing with the genre. It's defining the genre. I, I, I see it playing with really? the genre. Okay. because Well, because, you know... You have you have a chain of events. Yeah. First of all, they're farcical. Each new sort of wrinkle is almost funny in the way it brings in this. Doesn't Carmen? Wouldn't Carmen just go ahead and kill this guy? No. What if? What if there's a delay, like a seven degrees removed from the actual event? He's taking it as far as he can from the original or from the origin of the crime. And everyone along the way gets wiped out. For me, that's just sort of toying with this this idea of, of karma. Of karma, right? So everyone involved in this crime, even tangentially, gets nailed. Now, including the wife, even the wife, because she, and, and as far as I remember, she's told her husband tells her where he got the money, and she doesn't go. Wait, what did you do? She goes, "Huh, that's weird." Well, let's go hang out with the money. Okay, so there's a reason for her to get nailed as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but what you're looking at is sort of an amplification of 
the things that are already there. You're, he's not putting in something that's totally different that, that we don't know what to do with. It's like, I always keep coming back to action movies because that's what I see it as a parallel. Like, someone gets killed. But if it's, it, all, if all you need is the narrative component, all that needs to happen is he gets killed in the movie. He doesn't have to, you know, like, for example, Fargo, which is not an action movie. Is there any reason at all at the end of the movie for one to of the guys the to get... a wood chipper? Yeah. Is there any reason to see a body getting shot out of a wood chipper? There's no reason. Yeah. Well, to see it. To, you know, that he's disposing of a body, fair enough. We don't need to see it on the screen for the narrative to function. It's a crime drama. It's a genre piece. The detective has to catch the murderer. She's about to catch the murderer. Why do we have to see this happening? There's no real reason. But it fulfills some sort of, I don't know, added color, volume, turning up aspect of it. I just don't think for at least... Lee G and maybe the wife that it's fair. Mm. I think that heaven is wrong. Mm. I think that good deeds, because let's remember what he does with this bird. Lee G buys this bird and then apparently turns it over to the emperor. Mm. That's a good deed that completely does not function, does not have any, does not beget any good fortune. I suppose my question then would be, what would be a fitting punishment for this guy? Because he's involved, narratively speaking, in the chain of events. He buys the bird from a shady guy, this Cooper who shows up in the darkness. And if this was a sort of a film noir piece, he'd be whispering, hey, I got this thing, do you want to buy guess, it? And he goes, yeah, sure, I'll buy it. So what would be a good punishment? I guess what him? I would like is for him to be, in the story, what I would like is for him to be tortured and, like, to admit to the killing, despite the fact that he's innocent, and then all of a sudden, we have his friends, like, walk in at that very moment and go, actually, we're witnesses, he didn't do it. So you'd be okay with the torture, even though all he really did was just make an unfair, unwise From purchase. a narrative perspective, I'm okay with the torture. I'm not, in- wow. I'm not entirely sure that in real life... I would be okay with it, but this, for the sake of the story. This is for this, the sake of the story. This is coming into perspective why you're a Kill Bill fan. Um, it, it, it's just a little horrible, gory violence is okay, but not too much. As long as he lives. As long as he lives. I should point this out. So, some people have made the argument that actually Lee Ji does get rewarded, because even though he is tormented and executed by the state, for despite the fact that he's innocent... When the state finds out that he was innocent, the state goes and gives his family some money and exempts him, his, his, all of his descendants from corvée labor. There you go. So, so some, some good does happen, but... And so here's the thing. Here's the thing. In, in the context of that culture and that time, would his family have anything like that highest status and the exemption from corvée labor... If he'd just still been alive doing his thing. Well, I mean, if he gave the his this bird to the emperor, I would expect yeah, but he the, would get some well, sort of reward. It can't be the only bird the emperor ever gets. It's a very from. nice bird. It is a very nice bird. First I, off, I, let's, go before, ahead. As we're kind of like wrapping up this discussion of justice, I want to point something out. Go for We've it. We've been kind of, if I could, beating around the bush. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what is the bird actually a symbol for, Rob? Okay, I want, I want to say, before we say what the bird is a symbol of, there's a lot of dirty references in Huaban, and this isn't There's like so much this isn't like a juvenile high school English class reading into something. This is in the characters and the tradition itself. The commentators on the Huaban knew very well what was going on here. Yes. The fact that there's a kid going around all day, strutting his stuff, st- playing with his, with his, with bird. his cock in his cage. Yes. That he keeps in a cage. This is not haphazard. This is woven into the narrative. But there's a reason the word cock in English has another meaning, and that's penis. Yes. And it's the same in Chinese. We're not going to get into the reasons, but this is clearly something, at least in part of the story, about him and his sexuality. Right. Right. And even the, you mentioned it earlier, but Mr. Zhang cuts off Shen Xiu's head Throws it into a willow tree. Right. So we've got to point out head, same thing in English and Chinese. Yes. There's a kind of sexual connotation there. But you're right. Willows 
the Willow uh, Orchard is in vernacular. It's a, a, a word that has a, it's a double entendre. Yeah. That means a red light district. So yes. area with lots of prostitutes. Right. So let me ask this question. Um, at the, at the risk of sounding sort of dismissive, who cares? <laughs> There's all these, these sort of dirty double entendres. Why does this matter if we read the story? Well, I mean, it, it's significant for as far as the meaning of the story. Why? So Shen Cho is clearly one of the things that he's doing. One of the things that gets him in trouble is he's playing with his penis. So we didn't mention this. Figuratively, symbolically. Whatever. Yeah. I... But, but we didn't mention this. But one of the problems that... Shen Xiu has is he's 18 True. and he has yeah. not been married and his parents aren't forcing him to get married so he's childless what he should be doing if he is a good Confucian is going out there getting a wife that his parents choose for him and doing and doing the thing that all good Confucians should do which is making sons yes. he doesn't do that interestingly Mr. John the Cooper and his wife Childless as well. Yes. There's a lot of problems with parents and children here. You know, it's a really screwed up situation where when the father asks his two sons, hey, do you want to kill me and get the money for my head? Yeah. There's there's lots of problems. Breakdowns in the family structure. Really huge breakdowns. Another thing, which I just want to point out. So we've got this kind of penis uh, reading of this whole story, which I I find fascinating, but even I can only take that reading so far. Right. There is a political reading. There always is. There with Lee, there is always a political reading. The, the story is written during the Ming Dynasty, which is sometime in the, uh, it's probably like the 17th century, the yeah. early 17th century it's written. But the story actually happens during the Song Dynasty, mm-hmm. Hui Zong's reign. Now, Emperor Hui Zong is famous for several reasons. First off, he was very good at playing around with calligraphy mm. and painting and particularly bird painting. Mm. He was always playing around with these beautiful objects, his bird particularly, but he didn't get around to governing. And what happened is these guys from the north, the barbarians from the north, came down and sacked his capital, kidnapped him and his son, and took them back as prisoners. And they eventually died in the barbarian lands the Song Dynasty split in half, so it became, afterwards, it became the Southern Song, and it only ruled some of the southern half of China. The northern half of China was given over to this other group of non-Chinese people. The question is, is this story all about what happens when an emperor is just playing around with his birds, Mm -hmm. And isn't doing the thing that he ought to be doing, which is making sons and governing the country. Mm. Doing the right thing Confucian-wise. Yeah. And all of this violence happens. Some of it maybe not necessarily intended. These kind of unintentional consequences, right. which is what I would classify Li Ji as. Mm. Which is that's an interesting reading. Um, and some of the parallels are fairly obvious. Um What's really intriguing about a lot of the fiction of Feng Menglong, and this story in particular, is that it it can be read the way I would watch a Charlie Chaplin movie, which is that you can very profitably study it and really analyze a lot of what's happening, the, the, the social commentary in it, the, the way it plays off of genre tendencies, or you can just read it. I mean, Feng Menglong, we don't still have Feng Menglong stories because of his high literary stature. We have them partly because they were popular, yeah. right? I mean, he wasn't somebody who wrote... This is not James Joyce we're talking about, right? This is someone who was a bestseller. This is essentially a pulp fiction. Right. That has real literary value, exactly. but still pulp fiction. Yeah. So one of the reasons we keep talking about these Huaban is that it's they're a fascinating entry into the idea of what literature is because we usually think of literature as with this big capital L, you know, we have Homer, we have Shakespeare, we have Joyce, the canon, canon, right? Well, what about the sort of outliers? What about the people who were super popular? What about Arthur Conan Doyle? What do we do with that? You know, uh, do you put him on the same pedestal as, you know, Virginia Woolf or Charles Dickens or Kill Bill, if I may. 
Ah, Kill Bill. What? <laughs> we should have a podcast book. Well, we won't, actually, because it's not Chinese literature or whatever. Um, but this is an interesting story for precisely that. It's immensely popular. It plays off of all the genre stereotypes, cranks up the volume on some of those. So people are like, oh my gosh, he got tortured and murdered? That's awful. And you turn the page, you know. <laughs> um, and yet, he's also woven in this kind of sly political commentary, which... If you're even slightly intelligent, you'll really snicker at it the way you would in a really nasty political cartoon. Mm -hmm. So this is literature, quote-unquote, of the people, and yet it sort of challenges that a little there's bit. Some, there's some high and there's some low. It's all mixed in. And the reason it's an interesting story is because both are working. The low is working in true low fashion, right? You Dick have the jokes you get, everywhere. Exactly. You got nasty violence and, you know, double entendres where you're like, <laughs> he's playing with his bird all day. <laughs> Things like this that we're not making up. Um, and yet, there's a little, pol pol a little political commentary in there. There's some interesting twists on the idea of karmic retribution and sort of the whole nine yards. Yeah. So it's an interesting story. Can we leave it at that? Do you have anything else you want to part with there? Other than... No, that's it. <laughs> he was trying to think of some awful double entendre and just couldn't come to him. So, oh, wait, I just did because I just said... Oh, oh, high five. I didn't even intend to do that. I, I really apologize. But uh, our next podcast will Rob be a lot lost, more civilized. Rob lost his head, if I, I may. Oh, can we, okay, we're going to sign up now before it gets worse. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm Rob Moore. And I'm Lee Moore. This is the Chinese Literature Podcast. <laughs>